Hi friends, welcome to this Tuesday evening uh, critical care updates and uh, academic sessions. And uh, today we have an interesting topic. Uh, we have been discussing about uh, uh, many many critical care areas um, and uh, topics. Today we have an interesting area of uh, we say stress cardiomyopathy, tocosubo cardiomyopathy, broken heart syndrome. You name uh, either of the way, we are seeing more and more frequently nowadays uh, this being a phenomenon. There are many other uh, context-based uh, concerns of uh, heart, like we see peripartum cardiomyopathy, septic cardiomyopathy, sometimes uh, neuronal injury-induced uh, cardiac changes and uh, phenomenons. But the stress cardiomyopathy has evolved from a tokosubo of a typical uh, Japanese um, octopod cell like a apical ballooning to a nowadays uh, a very wide spectrum of uh, uh, cardiovascular changes or cardiac changes with a lot of stress in and around the ICUs and uh, even in the OT, even in the stressful condition, even including in the happiness. So this kind of uh, uh, catecholamine surge causing uh, cardiac dysfunction leading to a lot of confusion initially it's a tough time to dis distinguish it from the other coronary syndromes and cardiac events. So today, uh, to bring this topic to take an overview, we have Dr. Sri Charan, who is a consultant from uh, Heart and Lung Transplant Unit of uh, Sikindrabad, yes, other hospitals. He will take us through for the first initial 15-20 minutes of overview of what is this broken heart syndrome, where from it initiated, what are the clinical findings, and uh, what are the uh, current status and supportive care and the circulatory support as we have. Then uh, uh, we have two eminent seasoned um, clinicians in the Department of Cardiology, Dr. V. Rasik, sir, who is the clinical director of the Department of Cardiology, and he is a uh, both electrophysiologist and expert in that field of uh, electrophysiology, being a device uh, from the both uh, spectrum of all the devices in the cardiovascular system. Sir, we I welcome you on board and it's an honor and pleasure to have you on board, sir. Yeah, it's, my, it's my pleasure too. I hope I'm, I'm visible to everybody. Yes, sir, you're visible. So we have one more um, eminent uh, colleague of us, Dr. Bharat Puroit, uh, who is an interventional cardiologist and a director for the cath lab in the high tech uh, Yesoda Hospital. Uh, he will also be joining us. Uh, to have an expert panel on different aspects of what is this stress cardiomyopathy and broken heart syndrome all about. And we are talking about not just uh, supportive care, but beyond that. So with this, I over to you, Dr. Sri Charan, uh, to uh, start the overview. So <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Uh, today we'll be having a discussion about the uh, cardiogenic shock in general for a while and then we'll be discussing in detail about uh, broken heart syndrome or stress cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So <clears throat> what is cardiogenic shock? So we know that if there is a, uh, the patient who is having hypertension with significant organ, organ dysfunction and because of the cardiac reasons there, where there is pump failure can be called a cardiogenic shock but there are no specific definitions which we are seeing which we have seen but there are various definitions which have been defined in various by various societies and in various trials so what are the various definitions of cardiogenic shock we know <clears throat> according to the shock trial in 1999 the they defined cardiogenic shock as something with systolic blood pressure less than 90 for greater than 30 minutes or we are, we are using a vasopressor supports to maintain greater than 90 millimeters of mercury of systolic blood pressure with evidence of an end organ damage with human cardiac index of less than 2.2 or a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of greater than 15. Whereas the IOBP SOAP trial actually said that his main arterial pressure is less than 70 millimeters of mercury despite adequate fluid resuscitations with evidence of end organ damage that is urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour or serum lactates of greater than 2 millimoles per liter are considered patients of cardiogenic shock. The other definitions included the European Heart Societies. Uh, so so SBP less than 90 millimeters or greater than 30 minutes and evidence of end, end organ damage with increased filling pressures. Heart failure guidelines say that systolic blood pressure less than 90 with appropriate fluid resuscitation with clinical criteria of cold extremities, oliguria, altered mental status, narrow pulse pressures with laboratory investigations of laboratory evidence of metabolic acidosis, elevated serum lactates, elevated serum creatinine. Or the uh, most recent 2018 uh, Kamir NIH uh, study says that 
evidence of retard can damage and systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters. So mercury for greater than 30 minutes. So we, if we, the elements which are quite common in all of these definitions are the systolic blood pressure less than 90 for greater than 30 minutes and also evidence of endorgan damage. Now, why are we worried about the cardiogenic shock? Is that because it requires adequate perfusion? We need to intervene either pharmacologically or with mechanical circulatory support devices so as to maintain adequate mean arterial pressures and perfusion pressures to the end organs, thus preventing the end organ damage. So why are what are the causes of heart failure? So the ideology of heart failure can be because of an abnormal loading conditions or in a deceased myocardium. So this is a picture which actually gives us a, a clear cut idea for what are the various causes of uh, heart failures. It could be pericardial pathologies, which include consecutive peri pericardial tears, pericardial effusions, or endomyocardial pathologies, which include uh, endomyocardial fibrosis, endocardial fibroelastosis, high output states like severe anemia, volume overload, genetic abnormalities, which include hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, muscular dystrophies, metabolic disorders, which include hormonal disorders such as uh, hyperthyroid, hyperthyroid diseases, uh, micronutrient deficiencies, obesity, infiltrative myocardial diseases, uh, disorders like amyloidosis, storage disorders and immune mediated disorders uh, like infection related or non infection related which include myocarditis toxic damage ischemic heart disease and uh, peripartum cardiomyopathies and of course uh, our talker super cardiomyopathy so what is uh, stress cardiomyopathy or talker super cardiomyopathy or the classical broken heart syndrome so it has been classically observed that the patients who are having a significant emotional or a physical stressor they are developing uh, significant left ventricular dysfunctions and also almost going into acute heart failure like conditions. So this was initially thought to be an extension of an acute coronary syndrome or it was initially thought that probably it is involved with emotional stressors or physical stressors. Probably catecholamines are playing an important role in the development of this stress cardiomyopathy. So this name taco super cardiomyopathy is typically derived from this Japanese terminology where the heart assumes the shape of that an octopus trap. So why or how does a patient develop Takut supercardiomyopathy? So most of the uh, uh, things, uh, most of this pathology is actually related to the development of or exposure of a, a patient to an emotional or a physical stress, which can be found out in around 70 to 80 percent of the people. Whereas in some persons, we it is very difficult for us to actually identify a physical or an emotional stress or aspects. So what happens in case of a, either an emotional stress or a physical stress? So in case of an emotional stress, it, it is because of the activation of the limbic system and thus central noradrenergic pathways. So there is significant catecholamine release. So this significant catecholamine release is known to cause excessive stimulation of the beta receptors. They have excessive stimulation of alpha receptors of the coronary vessels. And there is also a metabolic disturbances. So this include positive inotropic effect initially, whereas excessive stimulation of alpha adrenergic receptors are known to cause coronary vasospasm and also microcirculated dysfunctions, which in, the, in uh, turn will cause decrease in the oxygen supply uh, relative to the demand. So these patients can also present with uh, symptoms which are closely related to an acute coronary syndrome also. So they might present to us with chest pain. They can increase present to us with like our uh, laboratory values might show increased troponin levels, increased BNP levels in, and ST changes. Even ST elevations can be seen. But because they don't have any coronary diseases, they, they are having any, they don't have any obstructive coronary artery diseases. So these patients might also have developed, they will develop left ventricular systolic dysfunction that is a dyskinetic apex. So, and because of these metabolic disturbances also, they are hypocontractile state and uh, there is left ventricular ballooning. So, this Takut super cardiomyopathy or stress cardiomyopathy as we are calling it now, it is actually uh, has been described classically in patients who are no, having no increased catecholamines catecholam in, in their circulation. So, patients who are in type B personalities or who are uh, having pheochromocytoma. It was initially uh, reported from a case of pheochromocytoma where the patient is known to have a higher, higher uh, uh, circulation of catecholamines in their blood. So, uh, so higher uh, incidence of higher incidence of catecholamines circulating in their blood, and so that is like the initial case reports. And they later found out that all these patients who are developing Takut super cardiomyopathy are no are known to have higher circulating catecholamines in their blood, whatever may be the reason. So it was initially thought that it is because of this catecholaminergic uh, overactivation, which is present inside which, in the blood, which can cause which is causing cardiomyopathy. Then came a relatively newer concept where saying that exposure of the heart to higher catecholamines need not necessarily mean that the patient is having higher catecholamines circulating in their blood, but it is even with the uh, direct uh, 
stimulation of the cardiac myocytes from with sympathetic nerve fibers which are directly descending from the rostral pons from the uh, cardiac centers if they also increase or if they also cause increased catecholamine secretion and heart myocyte is directly exposed to higher catecholamine concentrations this is also responsible for the development of stress cardiomyopathy or, or takotsubo cardiomyopathies so it, the concepts which were initially thought to be higher circulating catecholamines has now come to a place where exposure of myocardium to higher catecholamines. So this particular uh, uh, stress cardiomyopathy, it actually presents to us with balloons, ballooning of effects, significant LV dysfunction. There is low cardiac output, so which can present as dyspnea, syncope, or in case of severe conditions, it, can, it might even present, uh, present us with heart failure and cardiogenic shock. So we'll actually discuss about the other uh, features such as mitral regurgitation and left ventricular thrombus also later. So as age progresses, it is known it is known that the patient's vagal stimulation or the vagal uh, strength gradually comes down, and their sympathetic system will be at comparatively overactive than that of young population. So obviously, as age progresses, these patients are at a higher risk of developing stress cardiomyopathy. So who are at more risk? Uh, so who are at more risk is that uh, based on the various triggers, emotional triggers and the physical triggers, we'll actually discuss about who are, what are the subgroup of populations which are at higher risk of target supercardiomyopathy. So what are the various subtypes? So depending upon the pattern of the wall motion abnormalities, which we see in these patients, these are broadly classified into four types of target support, four types of stress cardiomyopathies. So these four types include the major, major type is the apical ballooning type, where we have, we see that the uh, left ventricular apex has a regional wall motion abnormality and it typically balloons with significant loss in the contractile state. And the second uh, most common is the midventricular wall motion patterns. So these are approximately seen in 14 to 15% of populations. So these typically seen in the mid cavitary uh, areas where it is where the basal kinetic, where the basal areas as well as the apical areas are hyperkinetic and midventricular or mid cavitary areas are hypokinetic. And comparatively, other rare forms are basal wall motion patterns and focal uh, wall motion patterns. So, in to expand on that uh, classification, so this apical ballooning shows a hypokinesia or a dyskinesia of the mid apical myocardial segments, and is associated sometimes associated with hypokinetic mid segments. So, LV twisting on 2D speckle track in imaging is reduced or reversed to clockwise apical rotation. It is it, it is reduced in this uh, acute phase. So. It is because of this uh, classical difference or uh, a problem in the twisting and untwisting of the ventricle also, there is actually a relative stasis of the blood which is present inside the apex which might cause LV mural thrombus. Or the other uh, causes are, the other cases are midventricular TTS which is uh, featured by midventricular segment uh, hypokinesia or dyskinesia. It typically resembles a cuff which is surrounding the mid cavity. The basal forms and the focal forms, as we have discussed, it is not so common, but these appear commonly in subarachnoid hemorrhage or epinephrine induced uh, uh, myopathies or pheochromocytomas. So what are the risk factors? As I was discussing, what are the various risk factors or the triggers for the development of stress cardiomyopathies? The risk factors include the hormonal risk factors, namely estrogen. Estrogen in, in women is known to have a protective effect on the endothelial cell layers. And postmenopausal women who have uh, who were deprived of this estrogen protective effect can act, are at more risk of developing stress cardiomyopathies. So some people can also be genetically predisposed to developing stress cardiomyopathies, especially who are having inducible pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytic uh, uh, mutations. These are known to develop some. Uh, these are more prone for development of uh, stress cardiomyopathies. Patients who are already having some pre-existing psychi psychiatric issues. So these uh, patients who are having pre-existing psychiatric issues will always will already be on some anti-psychiatric medications or their uh, adrenergic systems or sympathetic nervous system is in a typical overdrive. So in the, these patients are mo at more risk of developing uh, stress cardiomyopathies. So what are the various triggers we see? The triggers can be physical tr triggers. Physical triggers include infection, surgeries, trauma, central nervous system disorders, or uh, like respiratory failure, or there are there could be emotional triggers. So physical trigger induced uh, stress cardiomyopathy is typically common in male, males, male populations. They present to us typically with dyspnea, and they are more prone to developing acute heart failure and acute heart failure related complications. Whereas on the contrary, women are 
మోర్ ప్రోన్ టు డెవలప్ స్ట్రెస్ కార్డ్ ఏమైపోయింది విత్ ఇమోషనల్ ట్రిగర్స్ దే టిపికలీ ప్రెసెంట్స్ నాట్ విత్ డిస్నియా విత్ చెస్ట్ పెయిన్ బట్ దే టెన్ టు హ్యావ్ బెటర్ అవుట్కమ్స్ సో ది హ్యాపీ హార్ట్ సిండ్రోమ్ ఈజ్ అన్ ఇంట్రెస్టింగ్ కాన్సెప్ట్ వేర్ ద సే ఈవెన్ ఇఫ్ ద పేషెంట్ హ్యాస్ నాట్ నెసెసరీలీ నెగటివ్ ఇమోషనల్ రెస్పాన్స్ బట్ ఈవెన్ ఎ సిగ్నిఫికెంట్లీ హయ్యర్ స్ట్రాంగ్ పాజిటివ్ ఇమోషనల్ రెస్పాన్స్ సచ్ ఎస్ హ్యాపీనెస్ కెన్ ఆల్సో కాస్ కేటగాలి మీన్ సర్చ్ అండ్ దేర్ ఆర్ కేస్ రిపోర్ట్స్ విత్ సే దట్ పేషెంట్స్ హూ హ్యాడ్ దిస్ అక్యూట్ పాజిటివ్ ఇమోషనల్ రెస్పాన్స్ ఆల్సో డెవలప్డ్ సిగ్నిఫికెంట్లీ కార్డియోమయాపతి సో దట్ దట్ పర్టికులర్ సినారియో ఈస్ కాల్డ్ హ్యాపీ హార్ట్ సిండ్రోమ్ ఇన్ కాంట్రాస్ట్ టు బ్రోకెన్ హార్ట్ సిండ్రోమ్ now what are the various diagnostic criteria the various diagnostic criteria uh, there are like innumerable diagnostic criteria which were actually uh, given for the diagnosis of uh, stress cardiomyopathy among which uh, we will be discussing two of them the first one is revised mayo clinic criteria so the revised mayo clinic criteria suggests that there is transient dyskinesis of left ventricular mid segments with or without epical involvements there might be regional wall motion abnormalities which extend beyond say single epicardial vascular distribution and a stressful t- trigger is often present but it is not always necessary for us to diagnose a patient of stress cardiomyopathy so the clinching points here are that these patients might be having region- regional wall motion abnormalities also but they should typically not conform to the typical epicardial uh, vascular distribution patterns there should be an absence of obstructive coronary disease or absence of angiographic evidence of an acute plaque rupture so and there might be ecg abnormalities which may, which can even go up to st elevations or t wave inversions or there may they will also there will always be modest elevation cardiac troponin levels and there should be an absence of pheochromocytoma or myocarditis now coming to the international society for uh, like international registry for tacot supercardiomyopathy diagnostic criteria so <clears throat> these patients show transient left ventricular dysfunctions which can be presenting as apical ballooning or mid ventricular or various patterns of uh, uh, stress cardiomyopathy as we've discussed and similarly with that of revised mayo clinic criteria they also discuss the region wall motion abnormality usually extends beyond the single epicardial vascular distribution okay so but they did not actually completely rule out the possibility that it could be a, a stress cardiomyopathy even it is conforming to a single pattern of vascular distribution where they say that in patients who are having focal tacot supercardiomyopathy sometimes there might be a time where the region wall motion abnormality can Uh, correlate with that of a single epicardial vascular distribution but the re- the extent of myocardial de- uh, the extent of lv dysfunction will typically not correlate with that of the uh, acute coronary syndrome if at all the single epicardial vessel is diseased there will be there might be a physical emotional or a combined trigger but this is not typically obligatory neurological disorders or these are typically physical triggers as well as pheochromocytoma may serve as triggers then there will be new ecg abnormalities and these ecg abnormalities are typically very difficult to actually differentiate from an ongoing acute coronary syndrome levels of cardiac biomarkers are moderately elevated in these cases uh, the cardiac myo biomarkers are uh, increased almost in line with a non st elevation myocardial infarction in these patients st they don't rise to as high as we see in stemi but elevations of natriuretic peptides over and above what we generally see in acute coronary syndrome is quite common in stress cardiomyopathy so significant coronary artery disease is not a contraindication for the is not a contradiction to taco uh, super syndromes so there might be patients who are having an uh, ongoing like uh, coronary artery disease along with the taco super cardiomyopathy or there might be patients who are who might also have a ongoing acs in in parallel with taco super syndromes so it is we cannot actually differentiate between the uh, uh, differentiate between them in these cases patients having no have no evidence, evidence of infectious myocarditis and post menopausal women are predominantly affected so how do we actually differentiate how, what are the various patterns we see in various or uh, in these syndromes namely tacot super syndromes stemi and stemi and myocarditis so e- e- ecg ecg typically shows st elevations there might be st depressions qt interval prolongation can be seen in these tacot super syndromes in fact in the initial uh, 48 to 72 hours this qt interval prolongation can give rise to uh, like ventricular tachyarrhythmias and these need to be treated in- immediately there might be t wave inversions so they and these t st and the st changes can be global and they can be quite non localizing so the electrocardiographic findings in tacot super syndrome can be typically divided into three stages stage 1 stage 2 and stage 3 stage 1 is that there is will be de- deviation in the st stage 2 there will be t inversions and uh qt prolongations which typically is seen after 48 to 72 hours and then stage 3 is this resolution of t wave changes and qtc changes 
Whereas in ST elevation myocardial infarction, ST elevation in two contiguous leaks, with, there will be reciprocal changes. So, um, and the other uh, changes, like uh, in, whereas in non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, there will be like new horizontal or downsloping ST depressions, T wave inversions in two contiguous leaks with prominent R wave of RS ratio greater than one. Myocarditis, like there, there, there might be ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular ectopics, non-specific STT changes, like pericarditic changes can be seen. Regional ST elevations in QVFs can be seen. Uh, we actually, the other clinching uh, feature of the difference in the ECG as well as ECG in to differentiate between Takutsubo syndrome and ST elevation myocardial infarction or, or ACS per se, is that in ACS, after there is recanalization or revascularization, the myocardial contractile function as well as the ECG changes, they tend to normalize uh, simultaneously. Whereas in Takutsubo syndrome, the myocardial contractile function first recovers and it is only later that we can see these ECG changes normalizing. Troponin levels will be increased as I was discussing and it is more in line with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Creatine kinase will be normal. Transthoracic echocardiography. So we can see apical and midventricular wall motion abnormalities, but typically they extend beyond coronary artery distributions. Whereas in uh, acute coronary syndromes, we see regional wall motion abnormalities which correspond to a coronary artery distributions. In myocarditis, it is obvious, like it is normal, but they might have uh, regional wall motion abnormalities. When it comes to cardiac uh, magnetic resonance, uh, there will be, so when it is, it is typically, it is especially useful when we are there, when there is coexisting coronary artery disease or if the diagnosis is uncertain. So Takutsubo syndrome is typically associated with significant myocardial edema. Uh, we can actually see uh, LV thrombus and Takotsubo syndrome, because it does not necessarily lead to fibrosis, we typically do not see late gadolinium enhancement in ca cardiac magnetic resonance in Takotsubo syndromes. Uh, but in case of STEMI or non-STEMI, it might be a transmural infarct or a subendocardial infarct. In both these cases, we can see a subendocardial or full thickness late gadolinium enhancement and there will be obvious myocardial edema. In myocarditis, there is significant myocardial edema. There is, of, uh, there is evidence of inflammatory hyperemia or edema. There could be mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement, which is suggestive of myocardial necrosis. However, in Takotsubo syndrome, especially during the in the mid-cavitary variants of Takotsubo syndrome, because of the hyperkinetic in the base and hyperkinetic in the apex with inter in the intervening area of uh, wall significant LVD dysfunction, this causes decrease in the torsion forces and there might be some rims of fibrosis which can be appreciated as late gadolinium enhancement in cardiac magnetic resonance in Takotsubo syndromes. In coronary angiography, uh, it is you, normal, but there might be a pre-existing coronary artery disease, but you cannot identify a culprit lesion. Whereas we can actually, we should be able to identify a, a coronary artery plaque with or without a thrombus and leading to occlusion of vessels in STME or non-STME. Whereas in myocarditis, it is usually normal. So this is a picture of a 2D echo as well as a cardiac MRI, which is showing significant uh, apical ballooning with apical regional wall motion abnormalities with hyperkinetic base of the ventricle. Similarly, which is seen in the systolic phase as well as the, in the systolic phase and the diastolic phase of the cardiac MRI, where we see a, where we see that the apex is not contracting properly. The, in fact, cardiac MRI is also helpful in uh, identifying any LV viral thrombus. We can, uh, what are the various blood investigations? As I have discussed previously, the initial troponin levels are elevated in both Takotsubo as well as myocardial infarction, whereas the peak troponin levels are typically higher in the MI population, whereas the BNP or the NT pro BNP levels are typically markedly elevated in the stress card cardiomyopathy population. No, then comes an intertag diagnostic score. This intertag diagnostic score was actually put forth by the International Registry for Attacked Super Cardiomyopathy. So what do they uh, give is that uh, they have actually identified various risk factors uh, and they gave specific points which correlate with these risk factors. So these include female sex, <clears throat> known emotional stress, physical stress, uh, no ST segment depressions, known case of psychiatric disorders, neurological disorders, or QTC prolongations. So it is a base, it is actually... <clears throat> Uh, points are for 100 points and based on the number of points, uh, the computer actually calculates the how the probability of the patient having Takotsubo cardiomyopathy as opposed to acute coronary syndrome. 
So it is this particular tool is available in the uh, Intertag Diagnostic score, uh, like Intertag website, where if we actually tick these points, it gives us a score as well as a probability uh, score, giving that how much probability this patient is having uh, Takut Supercardium memory. Now, how do we manage uh, these patients who are having stress cardiomyopathies? So we, the management can be divided into three phases, namely the acute heart failure management phase. Then we treat the ongoing complications or we try to prevent the comp complications and treatment after discharge. So uh, management includes if the patient is having not, not without having any signs of heart failure. So we can consider AC inhibitors or ARVs and beta blocker therapy. However, as opposed to patients who are having significant cardiogenic shock or acute heart failure because of other reasons, patients who develop heart failure like symptoms or patients who are having significant LV dysfunctions, AC inhibitors, ARBs or beta blockers are not shown to have any survival benefit when compared to other uh, causes of heart failure. So if the patient is having a heart failure or pulmonary edema, <clears throat> then we ideally have to see if the patient is having a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It is because the cause of the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in these patients is not particularly understood, but it, uh, it is because of these uh, uh, twisting, of like the ventricular twisting or the regional wall motion abnormalities and also uh, difference in this uh, uh, spiral contraction of the left ventricle. There might be some degree of systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet, which can cause some degree of mitral leg agitations. And it is also causing some degree of left ventricular outflow tract obstructions. So we need to find out if the patients who are having hypotension, in, who are in cardiogenic shock or who are in cardiac failure to identify if the patients are having left ventricular outflow tract obstruction because it is it is that particular point which can actually change our lines of management. Say, if the patient is having LV, LV outflow tract obstruction, diuretics, nitroglycerin, IABP and including uh, current, uh, mechanical circulatory support like Impella are not ideally advisable. We initially have to treat the LV, out, uh, LV outflow tract obstruction with how, uh, judicious administration of IV fluids short acting beta blockers and we have to avoid diuretics we need to avoid nitroglycerin we need to avoid iabp however if the patient is having primary pump failure so then we have to go for an acute coronary like uh, sorry mechanical circulatory support so in these phases uh, in the acute heart failure uh, treatment phase if the patient is having cardiogenic shock with significant decrease in the mean arterial pressures pharmacological therapy with Noradrenaline, adrenaline, dobutamine, melanone, etc. is considered uh, controversial. Why? Because the, in the pathophysiology of the development of uh, stress cardiomyopathy itself, we have established that it is because of increased circulatory catecholamines or increased uh, in, uh, exposure of exposure of the heart to increased catecholamines is what causes this pathology. So, if you actually initiate these patients on noradrenaline, adrenaline, and other catecholaminergic uh, uh, inotropes or vasopressors. So the result might be counterproductive. However, it, they can be used, but they should be used in with uh, carefully so as to identify any ongoing cardiac dysfunction because of starting of adrenergic or uh, catecholaminergic uh, inotropes and vasopressors. However, uh, the drug namely levosimendan typically does not uh, is not catecholaminergic and it acts by uh, calcium channels. So levosimendan has been tried in patients who are having stress cardiomyopathies. So it is found to be helpful and we can use levosimendan in these patients. However, if the patient is still having significant pump failure, as I'll discuss later, uh, we'll have to use uh, a VA ECMO or a assist device, namely Impella. Now, what are the various complications which we see in these patients? The various complications include the, as I've discussed, arrhythmias. So arrhythmias typically occur because of during the phase of QT prolongation, in the initial phases of uh, Takut Super Cardiomyopathies. So these should be treated uh, with regular guidelines. So the beta blocker therapy, RV pacing, or they, they should be avoided, uh, LV, Q, QT interval uh, prolonging drugs. Okay. And uh, to, uh, what are the other factors for the treatment of other complications include the thromboembolic complications. It is because of the relative stasis of blood in the cardiac apex, which can cause LV mural thrombus. So, and this thrombus during the phase of uh, like uh, this thrombus needs to be treated with heparin or they should be treated with neural or oral anticoagulants or vitamin K antagonists. So how long should we be treating these patients? So these patients should be on anticoagulation at least till three months after discharge. It is because 
when there is a mural uh, lv intramural thrombus and the patient's cardiac function recovers later so this can cause embolization of the thrombus and these patients are at significantly higher risk than normal population to develop embolic strokes so in order to prevent that to happen these patients should be on judicious uh, uh, anticoagulation therapy so after discharge we ac inhibitors or arbs can be tried so if there is any other disorder underlying disorder like if the patient is having concomitant coronary artery disease the aspirin and statins uh, can be used or if the patient is having depression anxiety combined psycho uh, psychocardiac rehabilitation can be done recurrent prevention uh, ac inhibitors have been tried arbs have been tried beta blockers have been tried but none of them have actually shown a significant uh, decrease in the recurrence when it really comes to uh, takut subocardia myopathies so these can be considered but we don't have evidence for that so this is the summary of various inotropes and vasopressors which can be used now what are the various indications for mechanical circulatory, circulatory support so mechanical circulatory support indication typically occurs when it, we have, uh, when we are using the intermax uh, profiles so in the patients who are having profile 1 like critical cardiogenic shock who is having like in spite of uh, escalating pressure supports the, the organ perfusion is decreasing or if the patient is having progressive decline stable but on inotropic dependence so these are the typical intermax uh, criteria which we use or intermax profiles we use for initiating of patient on mechanical circulatory support for a patient who is on having cardiogenic shock so these profiles can be uh, extrapolated to patients who are having stress cardiomyopathies so even with that patients who are intermax profile one even with uh, me mechanical circulatory support uh, supports they can the their uh, survival rate is quite poor now what are the various ss devices we know the various ss devices which can be used in these in patients include iavp but iavp needs to be used in these patients taking into consideration the left ventricular outflow tract outflow tract obstructions so then comes the impeller device uh, impeller device is also uh, rather axial support uh, axial cardiac output support where it can be uh, like impeller 2.5 impeller 5 are uh, used where it uh, sucks the blood from the lv and uh, ejects the blood into the iota so this can be used tandem heart tandem heart is nothing but the uh, a transeptal placement of uh, uh, drainage cannula into the la and then it is oxygenated and it is pumped back into the iota so then comes and finally we can also talk about va ecmos uh, where uh, venous and the arteries uh, venous can ivc is uh, cannulated and blood is drained it is oxygenated it is pumped into the iota now what are we actually achieving when we are using these mechanical circulatory support devices in these patients so our aim is to decrease the cardiac work the patient is having significant uh, left ventricular dysfunction in these patients so our aim is to decrease the cardiac work so this is a typical pressure volume group of a patients so uh, where the a stands for the uh, the end the end diastole uh, where the closure of mitral valve and there is slowly fill sorry uh, this is the this is the end diastole there is uh, uh, there is isovolumetric uh, uh, ventricular contraction so we see the increase in pressures without increasing the volumes then we see the aortic ejection the rapid ejection the slow ejection and there is end systole at c and there is mitral valve opening at d so this area of this axial curve will help us will understand help us understand the uh, amount of cardiac work, work which is being done uh, iabp it actually improves the stroke volume it uh, decreases your uh, you can see uh, end diastolic volumes it actually decreases your end diastolic volumes and it also decreases your end diastolic pressures so this with this it can actually have a significant good uh, effect on the cardiac work so it improves the stroke volume and it offsets pressure reductions whereas impella it does not actually inc uh, no increases in stroke volume but it totally decreases the area of the pressure volume loop, which is the effect of the cardiac work which is being done by that now let us actually look at the various trials uh, of comparison between iabp as an impella in patients who are having heart failure but we have to take into consideration that these trials are typically done in the patients who are having heart failure secondary to acute coronary syndrome we, we do not have any trials to study the effect of uh, mechanical circulatory devices in patients who are having stress cardiomyopathy per se so this is the uh, protective study which is a prospective uh, clinical trial of hemodynamic support with impella 2.5 
versus IABP in patients undergoing high risk percutaneous coronary interventions, and this included patients who are having significant LV dysfunctions. So this particular study did not actually show any mortality benefit between MPLA 2.5 versus IABP. However, the amount of complications at the end of six months is typically less in MPLA group. The other study is the percutaneous mechanical circulatory support versus IABP in cardiogenic shock after acute myocardial infarction. So this is what the problem is. Typically, all these studies are done in patients who are having acute coronary syndrome. So we don't know whether these the results of these studies are can be extrapolated onto uh, stress, uh, stress cardiomyopathies. So this uh, also showed that we have used this simple device as well as the IABP. We showed at the end of the 30 days, there is no difference in mortality between uh, Impella as well as IABP devices. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charan. You can actually take off your slides. So thank you for that overview in this short time. I think you uh, placed that uh, ball rolling. Uh, Can you see this uh, slide, Charan? Yes. So, sir, um, we welcome Dr. Bharat Purait, sir, also. Uh, sir, can you switch on your uh, camera and mic, sir? Dr. Bharat Purait. Hi, Dr. Venkat. How are you? I'm good, sir. Uh, sir, good evening. Welcome you on board. It's always an honor and pleasure to have you on board, sir. Uh, um, so, Dr. Bharat Purohit, as I already mentioned, was a uh, the senior season clinician in the Department of Interventional Cardiology in uh, High Tech Yasoda Hospital and is being the director of cath lab. So, sir, can you switch on your uh, camera, sir? There is some issue with the video, I think. Okay, I'm sir. Able to switch on so, the audio, but so, not able to switch. Yeah. Can I log out and log in again? No, it's okay, sir. If you want, you can log in, but in the meantime, uh, okay, sir, you try to log in. In the meantime, we'll take uh, Dr. Rajsekhar. Sir, we have seen uh, Dr. Charan giving an overview, and uh, this is an article which actually uh, depicts uh, the whole uh, process of how a emotional stress, either it uh, say from a community or in a hospital setting, which can cause a catechonomic surge, uh, which can uh, some way the other causes a stress cardiomyopathy. We have similar conditions like which we see in septic cardiomyopathy, which is again a cytokine storm or inflammatory storm. And again, we see hormone-related storms causing peripartum cardiomyopathy. So what are these syndromes, sir? You deal, you, you being uh, clinicians who deal more of uh, the coronary vessels in and around, but these are the different uh, subgroups or subpopulations which come across to you, sir. What is your take on this? Yeah, actually, stress cardiomyopathy is an interesting condition. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yes, I yes, sir. you're perfectly audible. Uh, stress sir, cardiomyopathy. It will tilt, sir. Your head has been cutting off. It will tilt off. Yeah, perfect. Stress cardiomyopathy is an interesting condition because of the fact uh, uh, of the suddenness with which it occurs and uh, the most unexpected circumstances. And uh, what is important is to recognize and treat it and give supportive treatment. The treatment is largely supportive. And then, um, and most of the times, uh, the patients recover if the underlying uh, stressful situation is taken care of. But what is important is that uh, we need to have a differential diagnosis. It's very difficult to make a, a primary diagnosis of stress cardiomyopathy because it's uh, it is predominantly a, a diagnosis of exclusion and not a and not usually a very positive diagnosis because uh, there are several situations where you can have an MI with without any thrombotic coronary artery disease. It's called a type two myocardial. There's a universal definition of myocardial infarction. In which the type one myocardial infarction is the typical myocardial infarction with ST segment changes. And when you do an angiogram, you will see a ruptured plaque or a thrombotic lesion, or you will see a, a obstructive uh, plaque or an occluded coronary artery. Whereas a type two myocardial infarction is one where uh, you won't find any of these. In fact, you will find normal coronary artery. So, but then everything else mimics a myocardial infarction, including the ECG changes, the echocardiographic findings, and the enzyme and the cardiac enzyme. Uh, levels in the blood. But the major difference is that in type 2 myocardial infarction, there is myocardial injury and often permanent myocardial damage. That could be that is largely because of a mismatch 
between the oxygen demand and the oxygen supply. So that could because that could happen. Uh, that could also happen in the setting of an intensive care unit in a patient because of extreme tachycardia, extreme hypotension, extreme uh, 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 what do you call uh, because of arrhythmias, incessant arrhythmias, because of uh, very fast uh, uh, heart rates and uh, situations like that. So this also can cause uh, this can cause a myocardial injury and often a permanent myocardial damage. And they are uh, they often behave like an MI patient, except for the coronary arteries will not have any blood. So that is one thing that we need to exclude. Stress cardiomyopathy is typically we make a diagnosis when uh, we see the typical echocardiographic picture. We see a lot of atypical findings, but I think the most typical finding is the apical ballooning. And this apical ballooning itself will cause some kind of a dynamic left ventricular outflow obstruction. It's not a fixed obstruction, but it's a dynamic left ventricular outflow obstruction. And uh, typically occurring in a postmenopausal woman, and there's often a acute trigger, you can identify it. Uh, quite often it's an emotional trigger, and um, sometimes it's a physical trigger. So it is important to make the distinction because uh, the prognosis is a little bit different in each of these uh, situations. So mm -hmm. having said that, uh, I think uh, he has uh, quite beautifully covered uh, uh, all the aspects of the disease, uh, including the, the pathophysiology. And uh, So you, you said we have type 2 uh, myocardial infarction where you may not find any typical vessel occlusion in any form, but you will have a myocardial injury, maybe because of demand perfusion mismatch or any of that. Yeah, so we, see, we see a classic classic situations which ha also happens in some of the stress cardiomyopathies where you have a catecholamine induced uh, stress injury which again causes the same so uh, this is a crux where how do you differentiate between these two conditions basically what will happen is if you do a if you actually do a, a pet ct on them if you do a pet uh, uh, ct you will actually see uh, areas of hypoperfusion typically in uh, type 2 MI. It's basically, they'll have everything. They'll have regional volume, like regional decrease in perfusion, as well as uh, uh, everything except that there is no block to explain that. Whereas uh, when you say stress cardiomyopathy, it is usually more of, uh, uh, we'll say, myocardial edema, and uh, uh, you will not have any, a, though there may be regional wall motion abnormality and regional involvement, but you will see a more or less of a global involvement uh, and global myocardial edema and, uh, and things like that when you do a, a PET CT. Uh, but basically, you make a stress cardiomyopathy uh, based on a set of circumstantial factors and absence of coronary artery disease in a typically in a postmenopausal woman. And ultimately, it's microvascular dysfunction, uh, which occurs in both, but it's like uh, more segmental in uh, something like a, in an MI uh, situation, whereas this is often more global in uh, stress cardiomyopathy. So, sir, the other component you said is uh, one will have myocardial injury and infarction, uh, the other will ha not have any myocardial infarction. So they won't be, they usually never any permanent myocardial damage and stress cardiomyopathy because yes. most of them they recover. So, but most of the times we don't uh, go into a PET CT just to confirm things. Uh, both will end up in the similar kind of uh, initial presentation and also a angiogram. So, at that point of time, uh, how do you take uh, of that, sir? Basically, initially it's a supportive treatment because the treatment is just supportive. Treatment management uh, doesn't differ. Management is just management of heart failure in both situations. And then uh, subsequently, oh. once the acute phase is over, uh, and there's, uh, if there is a uh, persistence of left ventricular dysfunction and persistence of regional wall motion abnormality, I think uh, that's where we do a cardiac PET or a cardiac MRI to look at perfusion and look at, basically this is called a prognostic significance. Uh, Dr. Purohit, uh, welcome you back. Uh, we were discussing about uh, uh, how difficult it is to differentiate between a type 2 myocardial infarction or an acute coronary syndrome to a stress cardiomyopathy, which can just mimic like a type 2. And uh, the, probably uh, we will like to know from you, 
how frequently we come across uh, this kind of stress cardiomyopathies, which may be initially diagnosed as an ACS or been taken as a uh, non-ST elevated MI or a type 2 myocardial infarction. How frequently you come across? What is the clinical experience in this context? See, if you look into the literature, the first, uh, uh, first uh, publication of something which is similar to stress cardiomyopathy came in the 80s. 84 or 85. By that time, the no name was not given. And then subsequently in the 90, when Sato first described this kind of a situation where uh, he saw this patient who had uh, stress and then subsequently they were going to LV dysfunction, this problem became more and more uh, aware and more and more people started recognizing recognizing that yes, there is something uh, like this which, which, is, which is actually happening in this world. And uh, many a times, as uh, Rashika sir uh, told also, earlier we used to uh, see the patient coming with the uh, ECG changes and we used to do an angio and we find that a very minimal angio. So we used to put it like, a, okay, probably either it's a recanalized artery and all this thing. But subsequently with the development of CTA, development of MRI and other things, we realized that there is not much of myocardial infarction happening here. Yeah, because of uh, coronary spasm and vasospasm, little bit of uh, troponin levels are getting elevated. But true infarct leading to myocardial muscle damage actually is not happening. And that's one other reason why many of these patients, they start recovering and they, they become all, absolutely all right. And uh, if it's sometimes it's really very difficult uh, to differentiate because uh, there was a registry which showed that almost 25% of people who have this stress cardiomyopathy, they do not have a trigger also. So in those scenario, if suppose like you remember a few days back, I think two, three days back, we had a patient who had undergone a arthroscopy yes. and post arthroscopy, the patient developed severe LV dysfunction with subtle ECG changes in anterior septal leaves and tropi was elevated. We did an angio, it was absolutely normal. Sure. And then we diagnosed that the patient to be having stress cardiomyopathy and uh, after after one week when they came for follow up yes. the lv has absolutely recovered to normal the so that, that clearly says that yes probably this was a stunning and stress myopathy because of cardiomyopathy and then he has recovered so major way of uh, differentiating between the two is to sometimes it will be really difficult to say what is going on but if we have a trigger and then we have a subsequent insult which is happening then probably we, we diagnose it as a stress cardiomyopathy rather than, rather than an infarct because of uh, demand supply mismatch, which is going to happen. I think both of you put it the same line saying ki, uh, this will be a diagnosis of exclusion. It's very right. difficult to uh, pinpointly say this is all related to stress cardiomyopathy and ignore the other possibilities of ACS or a type 2 coronary uh, phenomenon there. And exactly that case a week back, a senior clinician's mother who just went an arthroscopy, which is considered to be a very low serious uh, surgery or a low kind of uh, intensity surgery, which led to uh, such a kind of uh, hypotension, soft, cardiogenic phenomenon, low perfusion state. And the, surprisingly, the whole echocardiography is tending towards some RWMA, which we saw a focal, which is very rare, not been a good segment or a component of the whole phenomenon is ballooning of epites. And uh, very rarely we see the base being uh, dilated and rarely we see a focal. And uh, that made actually the whole uh, the system, the, the intraoperative <coughs> team, the cardiology team, the intensive care team, all uh, roaming around it and keeping a uh, fingers crossed, doing an angio, excluding a coronary syndrome, then probably concluding this probably looks like a stress cardiomyopathy, maybe a small trigger, sometimes may trigger this kind of phenomenon. And then... In a daytime, we could wean the vasopressors requirement. As you said, in a week time, you send me an echocardiography, which looks almost normal. So uh, this probably is triggered me so that we should be learning uh, across the length and breadth. The second part is, why do we see this apical ballooning, Dr. Bharat Purahit? What is the uh, typical reason why that is a typical <clears throat> pattern? See, we do, we, see, as such, we don't have much uh, information about the pathophysiology, why it happens, the Takusubo. But uh, some pathophysiological studies have seen it is the distribution of the receptors and the adrenergic innervation which is happening differentially. There are more of beta adrenergic receptors which are at the apical level and the adrenergic innervation is more towards the basal level. 
and that's the reason why when you have certain local surge of catecholamines and there is a stunning which is happening at the apical area you don't see that part uh, contracting well and because of the hyper uh, uh, activity of the basal part you try to see that there is a little bit of narrowing and many a times it leads to such a extent that it can cause obstruction also so that's the reason why you get this differential involvement of the apex and the basal part of the uh, basal part in the of the lv in this kind of a scenario but it's not a sign quo none the 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 exact mechanism why it is still not very clearly known to most of the people but this is one uh, most widely accepted theory because of the differential uh, beta adrenergic receptors distribution which is there in the lv because till now we have not been able to clearly delineate where exactly is the distribution in the human beings this is a indirect implication of what we have seen in the mammals the mammalian heart whatever they have seen this is what happened so probably they have extrapolated with that finding into this also i think that is that is what makes the difference the name started with tokosubo uh, probably <laughs> octopus vessel with a very narrow neck and a wider base uh, apical ballooning now that has been expanded to stress cardiomyopathy which is more generalized term we are seeing more and more that happening and i was talking about a stress across length and breadth uh, the stress can be a community emotional intra operative intensive care sepsis many things so sir we have seen here if uh, uh, i i you can see this uh, the uh, slide said uh, the focal or rwms has been very rare extremely rare uh, and you said most of the times it doesn't correlate with uh, uh, with your uh, territory of the vessels uh, rasekar sir but uh, sometimes it do happen it happened to that last case where it is uh, territorially uh, so uh, how and uh, what is your experience in this types uh, even the apical balloon is considered to be most common typically like you see this apical ballooning that's because of the of the sympathetic uh, surge there is hyper contractility of the mid ventricle so it's something like causing a mid ventricular outflow obstruction that causes apical ballooning uh, that's what happens even in some cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also similar phenomenon happens so that's why the most common and the most uh, classical appearance is the apical ballooning so when we see this kind of apical ballooning the others are all gray areas so it is in the other areas then we think of more differential diagnosis and more uh, more other possibilities especially when you have this focal and uh, something like regional wall motion abnormality and things like that that's when we need to take in the differential diagnosis of type <coughs> because of you know uh, uh either spasm or coronary emboli or because of any you know extreme mismatch between demand and supply but then uh, i think for practical purposes at the level of uh, an intensivist uh, who takes care of this critical ill patient i think what we should do is we should uh, remember that when there is a sudden onset of uh, heart failure in an apparently previously normal heart Uh, with an identifiable trigger, uh, and uh, in the in the typical patient who's a uh, postmenopausal woman with this typical appearance of apical ballooning, uh, I think we should think of a stress cardiomyopathy. Um, but of course, end of the day, all these patients uh, are managed similarly, except that if it's actually an MI. Uh, which is even angiogram the treatment is totally different we do a primary angioplasty and if it's uh, uh, if it's uh, if the coronaries are completely normal and then we we manage the heart failure and usually most of these uh, patients they they improve the ones that have very minimal rwm and all they actually improve faster the ones that have more profound global dis uh, dysfunction have uh, have for a worse prognosis and you know the, their heart failure is much more severe and some of them may have a cardiogenic shock so i think uh, the crux is to identify the typical case and then uh, give adequate supportive treatment timely supportive treatment i think that's what is required so you said sir the if you echocardiography have a very typical apical ballooning which is very common you are more convinced about possibility of a stress cardiomyopathy with an insulting phenomenon Exactly. you can go with that but if you have the other variants which are rare 
So there are gray areas then we need to have a yeah, my exclusion yeah. by a quaternary angiogram and then come to that conclusion. And you said very important point, uh, either it is a type 2 myocardial infarction or intact vessel in case of the stress cardiomyopathy, the management remains to be supportive with uh, taking care of your heart failure, supporting the organ system, supporting the perfusion, wait and watch for exactly. its recovery in the either way. So there is another point which Dr. Charan was also pointing out, uh, basal and inverted variant is more common with FIO and uh, high catecholamine conditions. Is that right, Dr. Charan, you are trying to point out that? Charan, you are muted. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, the uh, basal variants, it is, uh, it is commonly seen in patients who are uh, having pheochromocytomas or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Any, any comments on that, Dr. Purohit? Any... Yeah, there is no, as I said, okay, there is no clear-cut uh, uh, pathophysiological data to suggest what exactly is causing a differential involvement in this patient. Okay. One important reason I will just add to what uh, the discussion was going on is, uh, if you see when you have apical ballooning, it is at least involving two coronary artery territories. If you see only the basal part is involved, so maybe it is a LADN circumflex or LAD and RCA which is most likely LADN circumflex should be involved. When you do an angiography and you see that absolutely normal, if it is only LAD territory involvement, you do not get that kind of a typical apical ballooning in a in an acute MI situation. So that indirectly tells us that probably we are dealing with a tacosobo because I just saw one chat box that suppose somebody has done a thrombolysis in a STEMI patient and he has come to you and you have done an angio and the angio looks normal. So do you feel that it could be a tacosubo or it was just a recanalized artery? One way of diagnosing this is either you do an IVUS because by doing a thrombolysis you cannot remove the entire thrombus. When you do an IVUS or an OCT you can always see the thrombus, uh, the residual thrombus there or the plaque rupture there. Clearly you can see that. Another way is you look at the territory which is involved. If it is a anterior MI and you have done a thrombolysis, you see normal coronary arteries. You don't get this typical ballooning kind of a uh, MI eco pattern which 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 is you get in this kind of a taco sumo. So these okay. are certain criteria uh, which can help you in differentiating whether you are dealing with a recanalized LED or whether it's a truly a taco sumo, uh, which is uh, because of the stress which the patient might have had. A any comments on this different scoring system which we are seeing uh, the intertac or a MIO scoring sir, uh, sir, sir, any importance of the scoring at this point of time? Yeah, basically. Yeah, you know that uh, uh, when yeah, basically you have got the circumstantial uh, evidence, uh, the, the triggers which uh, carry important points. So if you can go, if you can show that uh, list, I will list them. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Myo clinic scoring is more clinical. If you see that, it, it based on the AC change, a little bit of angiography finding and all this. See, but inter attack has become a little more extensive. <laughs> in this, if you see the criteria, you see the maximum number of points is given to the circumstantial. The female postmenopausal oh. with emotional trigger gives you 50% of the points. Yes, yes, okay. I agree. So if these two are there and you have this thing, then you have a can reasonably good in making a diagnosis of Takasumo. That is again the same circumstantial criteria has been put into one of those criteria. So that is the most important uh, uh, situation. So when you have a postmenopausal woman, you identify a trigger, new onset LV dysfunction, typical echocardiogram uh, periods, and normal coronary arteries, I think the diagnosis is straightforward. It's pretty much clear. Okay. And in the other cases, because there is a wide spectrum, if you see so many, so often we have seen, uh, even in Sikandrabad, we have seen so many times we get calls from the uh, AMCs and ICUs saying that troponin is like in hundreds and then somebody has got ST elevation, global ST elevations and global ST depressions and stuff like that. And when you do angiogram, they're normal. So not all of these are stress cardiomyopathies. Some of them could be type 2 MIs. So the difference, the important reason to differentiate is that any of these type 2 MIs, they are left with some degree of LV dysfunction is left with. They are not completely reversible. Whereas tacos, if they get over the acute phase, the acute heart failure is tidied over on follow-up, they usually have near normal heart. And these people don't require like stadium, they don't require, I mean, unless otherwise indicated. So uh, beyond, a, beyond the acute period, whereas uh, 
the other patients they may require so the three most common differential in this particular paper uh, talks about uh, acs acute myocardial infarction myocarditis and stress cardiomyopathy and uh, uh, there were some uh, the findings of electrocardiography echocardiography coronary angiogram and cardiac mri and biomarkers so if you see most of them are overlapping sir so yes. any, any comments in any points which you want to make a difference yeah actually in the classical case there is less confusion it's in the subtle cases and in the overlapping in this uh, where we see some focal area some regional wall motion not the class something that doesn't fit in the classical picture then the differential diagnosis comes in so and of course also the important is whether it's a recanalized mi all these situations come in but then in the acute management i think it is merely of uh, academic interest to make a diagnosis i think the management is management of heart failure mm -hmm. and on follow up we generally need to all of them of course need to have a coronary angiogram that is a must that is a must because that a normal coronary angiogram is is mandatory to diagnose any of these situations and uh, and uh, subsequently on follow up then when other parameters and other uh, tests are available to us we got a pet ct and cardiac mr they're good Uh, we can also assess regional perfusion. We can also assess uh, regional scarring and things like that, because those are helpful in prognostication and uh, long-term management. Dr. Puroit, uh, Dr. Asik was pointing out uh, it's more of uh, the clinical uh, or academic interest to confirm things. Uh, where do you find the cardiac MRI on a PET CT role in uh, context? He said uh, sometimes when you don't have a typical situation and you have a typical finding. you have overlap you have confusion maybe you can take uh, help of them where do you find uh, this help marker help or uh, mri help him mark uh, he, if you see this table which you have presented the clinical presentation ecg finding echocardiography angiography angiography is almost same in all the thing you don't see much of a coronary stenosis only thing is if you have a coronary artery disease you will see evidence of uh, plaque rupture whereas in myocarditis and in uh, takotsubo you won't get any evidence of plaque rupture maybe just little bit of uh, mild disease may be there but you won't get much of a plaque rupture actually happening so presence of a thrombus when you are doing an angiography nowadays we are doing more of imaging also so at that point of time if we we are convinced that it is patient has already been given a thrombolysis and all those scenario we can do a Uh, intravascular imaging either oct or ivs and demonstrate whether there is a plaque rupture and some thrombus is there to say it is an mi second thing is uh, it has got a treatment related value because uh, how do we label the patient uh, if it is a myocarditis whether it is takotsubo or myocarditis these are all uh, going to be treated in a traditional line of uh, conventional beta blocker as inhibitor and all this thing but the moment you label the patient as a mi then you have put a big stigma on the patient and there is a lot of social implication on this patient also and you need to treat them with a long term statin and aspirin of course in takotsubo you may have mild cad where again you will have to put the patient on uh, aspirin and statin also so uh, in terms of uh, differentiating the mri truly has a role because if it is more of a subepicardial and uh, edema you see it is more suggestive of a myocarditis and it should be more global involvement in comparison to what you have in uh, in, a, in a acute mi where it is more uh, confined to the uh, to the coronary artery territory which you are uh, dealing with similarly if it is a takotsubo you you don't get a typical coronary pattern but you get the typical phenomenon of a apical uh, uh, ballooning kind of a uh, endo, uh, edema which is there so this is if you are having a very global involvement then probably you are dealing with a with a myocarditis if it is a focal specific to a coronary artery territory probably it's a mi if it is fitting more into a apical ballooning kind of a thing then probably yes you are dealing with a with a with a takotsubo of course there will be some overlap where you may have little difficulty in identifying but i think more or less the an mri and a, coronary angiography with a little bit of uh, uh, intravascular imaging can differentiate in between all the three of 
there is an interesting uh, slide which actually Dr. Uh, Charan projected ki when you have a stress cardiomyopathy with maintained cardiac, preserved cardiac output and when there is a low cardiac output. So again, uh, we, the, he also classified whether there is a LVOT obstruction or without LVOT obstruction. So this looks like such a uh, classical clear pathways for this. Uh, so any take on this, Dr. Puroit? Yeah, definitely. See, if you have a, if you have diagnosed a patient to be uh, stress cardiomyopathy, you will try to avoid giving them uh, noradrenaline or epinephrine. So the inotrope of choice becomes either a melanone or a dobutamine or levosimendan. We generally prefer uh, levotimendan because it works in a different way and the arrhythmogenicity may be a little bit less compared to dobutamine or uh, uh, milrinol. Uh, so, but availability of libosimendan is a little bit out. Earlier we used to get it, but now I don't know whether it is still available. Uh, it's not available. Uh, it is available. Simenda used to be the trade name, I think from so Lupin it's company. It was not available. I was told it is not available. Uh, the, so uh, that is one thing we we are supposed to avoid giving uh, uh, too much of inotropic support and inotropic support requirement comes when the patient is in hypotension and uh, most of the time the patient may not be in hypotension where you can treat this patient with a conventional decongestive therapy with ACE inhibitor ARBs and a beta blocker a little bit and uh, other vasodilators like nitroglycerin and all these things uh, which you can give to this patient. But the whole challenge comes when the patient has hypotension. At that point of time, we need to check the 2D you can see whether truly there is LVOT grade, uh, obstruction is happening or not. If there is a LVOT obstruction, then probably that may be the reason why patient is in hypotension and we should try to release that LVOT obstruction by giving them more of uh, IV fluid and giving a little bit of beta blocker in the subset of patient. And if the patient doesn't have LVOT obstruction, then probably the patients, uh, the LV's cardiac output is not enough because of the severe LV dysfunction. So we need to improve the cardiac contractility by giving milrinone or dobutamine or levosimendan in this subset of patient. And if it doesn't involve, we can go for uh, 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 impella or we can go with a uh, ECMO in this set of patient in the, in the end. Uh, Rasika sir, where do you think, uh, we now had a clear idea that if you have a low cardiac output high, Low cardiac output situations we are now dealing with will come to later. High cardiac, normal cardiac output, probably dealing with a systolic failure as we generally deal with pulmonary congestion is the phenomenon which a typical venodilator diuretics or atrial vasodilators will be a phenomenon. With SOC, with LVOT, without LVOT, we are now trying to see and landing into a situation where things are not happening and we still have a low perfused state. So, how do you see this circulatory assisting devices? What is the role of IABP to start with, Dr. Asikas? IABP helps. You know, IABP helps. We, we don't have too much uh, you know, positive evidence uh, from randomized trials. But IABP does help in clinical practice. It does help. So, but IABP helps more if there is some kind of a coronary artery disease. In the absence of uh, coronary ischemia, IVP is only marginally, if at all, helpful. But in these patients who are really in this uh, kind of a cardiogenic shock, on inotropes, blood pressure less than 90, I think this, these patients are usually far beyond uh, the stage of IVP. Uh, IVP typically will help if there is a kind of a mitral regurgitation without left ventricular or throat tract obstruction. With reasonable with preserved uh, blood pressures, then IVP will definitely help in this situation. But otherwise, uh, these, in these patients who have, say, uh, refractory shock, that is inotropes, BP less than 90, and uh, then uh, with refractory heart failure, Definitely, uh, the short-term mechanical uh, circulatory support uh, is very useful in saving lives. And, uh, and the one that is uh, easily available and that can be instituted uh, uh, is uh, ECMO. ECMO is something that can be readily done in our setup because we've got a huge experience with ECMO during the COVID mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. You know, arterial ECMO is what is uh, usually used. Because this maintains the cardiac output, 
Uh, but one, there's one problem with ECMO is that ECMO increase, increases the left ventricular afterload and thereby may, may further uh, reduce the stroke volume and uh, further reduce the cardiac output. So we need to actually unload the left ventricle in these patients in, you know, we put ECMO. So for that, uh, we often use an IABP in concomitantly with uh, ECMO. So the IABP will reduce the afterload and then the ECMO will increase the cardiac output. So this combination works. Uh, but of course, Impella is a very useful device. Impella, uh, we have experience with Impella. We normally use it uh, 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 as a support during coronary intervention, either in cardiogenic shock or during the performance of uh, coronary intervention in a high-risk patient with severe LV dysfunction, you're doing a left main intervention, single surviving coronary artery, uh, in a patient with severe LV dysfunction and low cardiac output, uh, we use Impella. Impella is basically a very simple device to insert. It's something like a pigtail, which is inserted uh, uh, through the femoral artery uh, with either a 13 fringe or a 14 fringe sheath. And at the pigtail, the inflow is in the left ventricle and the outflow is in the iota. Basically, it's a pump that takes out blood from the LV and pumps it into the iota. So it unloads the left ventricle. So, uh, so Impella is very effective and Impella uh, can be, there's something called Impella CP, uh, which can be kept, which gives a cardiac output of about three to four, three to 4.5 liters. And this can be uh, kept in place for up to five days. Uh, and then uh, it is useful in uh, the desperately sick and very critical patients. But sometimes, you know, then there's a concomitant uh, uh, say, uh, of course, uh, when there's a significant left ventricular outflow obstruction, impella uh, should not be considered. Um, yeah, I think that's another phenomenon I wanted to just ask, sir. If you have a LVOT uh, obstruction, the outflow obstruction is there, hmm. IAPP and impella may not be a wide choice. Whereas, mm -hmm. as you said, VA ECMO preferably a preferred choice, and this will be a choice when outflow obstruction is not there. What is your take on that? Exactly, because when there's an outflow obstruction, when you put an IABP, you're going to increase the outflow obstruction. So basically anything, uh, anything that reduces the peripheral resistance will increase the, it's a dynamic LV outflow obstruction. Like you give vasodilator to a patient who's got outflow obstruction. It is like giving vasodilator to a patient who's got severe aortic stenosis. That will increase the obstruction because it reduces the aortic pressure. And by reducing the aortic pressure, it increases the left ventricle outflow obstruction. It's counterintuitive, it's counterproductive. Uh, whereas ECMO, basically, because you're taking out the blood from the, the large veins of the right atrium, and it is and it's going into the aorta, so LV outflow obstruction doesn't have any bearing on that. But if you put the patient exclusively on ECMO for a longer time, then it causes uh, uh, what you call LV volume uh, overload, because there's a, a retrograde flow in the aorta. There's a backward flow in the aorta increases the uh, total peripheral resistance and increases the uh, pressure uh, on the left ventricle and therefore the left ventricle has to dilate. So it increases the left ventricle dilatation and can worsen the pulmonary edema and heart failure. So therefore, uh, usually, you know, when we use ECMO, along, sometimes we use ECMO along with Impella. It's called ECPELLA. It's called uh, EC uh, ECMO ECPELLA. Uh, EC for ECMO, Impella for Impella. So what you do is you combine a, uh, Impella with ECMO and uh, in some of the very bad uh, situations, this actually gives much better survival rate compared to ECMO alone. Dr. Bharat, so, any, any comments on this flow of use of circulatory devices in these situations? See, the whole idea of uh, assist devices comes with what are we going to achieve? The whole purpose is what is our goal in a particular patient and in which stage of cardiogenic shock the patient is. That will decide what kind of device we are going to choose. Now we have two scenarios here, right? One with LVOT obstruction, one without LVOT obstruction. Suppose we go with a standard one with LVOT obstruction a little rare. So let us first discuss the patient is there uh, who has a stress cardiomyopathy. There is no LVOT obstruction here and the BP is somewhere around 90 or 80. And uh, this is clearly a hemodynamic abnormality in this patient. The patient has not gone into a renal failure. There is no involvement of the liver and all those things. 
so this is purely a hemodynamic advantage so we need to support this patient now if you look at iabp how the iabp works hemodynamics of iabp iabp basically it improves the diastolic perfusion and in a patient who has got a got a low bp you see the diastolic perfusion will be less because the systolic the blood pressure is around say 70 by 40 so the diastolic perfusion will be 40 minus lvedp of say 20 it will be 20 so the moment you put uh, iabp the diastolic perfusion improves and that will reduce the wall stress the lv contractility will somehow improve better if you don't put iabp the patients because of the relative ischemia may have little difficulty in working and if you put a iabp as sir has already said it reduces afterload so the patient who has already failing heart if you reduce the afterload the cardiac output will definitely improve but to what extent it will improve you may, we all know that iabp improves maximum cardiac output by 1 or 1.5 liter it cannot go beyond that so if the shock is very early the easiest thing to do is put the patient on iabp and that will definitely unload the ventricle improve the diastolic perfusion make the uh, wall stress little bit of less and the cardiac work will be improved and patient will feel better but if the patient is slowly going as he has talked about the intermax uh, stages but if the patient is going from hemo hemodynamic to hemometabolic stage where the lactase have started growing up because of the hypoperfusion where the kidneys have started uh, going down because of the low urine output this is not enough you need some more cardiac output and then scenario because there is no lv outflow tract operation using an impella will be a good option but it is a pretty expensive device and impella which is used for supporting the circulation has to be impella cp it cannot be a conventional impella which gives a 2.5 liter which we generally use for high risk pci so it has to be cp or 5 5 is not available in india so we have to go by cp and and C, because it is a purely left ventricular problem, so Impala CP in this scenario should be a good option. And you, it will unload the heart, it will pump the blood into the circulation, and the patient's coronary perfusion will improve and things will be much better. But slowly when the patient is still not responding and he is trying to go into a more of a hemometabolic where the lungs are still congested and uh, the perfusion to the kidneys are not happening, so you need to improve the blood pressure in this patient also. which you cannot achieve it only with an ampulla and that is the situation where an ECMO will come into a picture in this subset of patient because it will not only improve the, the oxygenation, it will improve the map of the patient because the systolic pressure is going up. So the patient starts feeling very good. The patient is already on a little bit of impella and you have added an ECMO, this patient will show dramatic improvement. You look at another scenario where the patient has come to you and he is in a, in a severe shock. Severe shock means BP is very, very low. There at that point of time, thinking of a impella and, and waiting for things to deteriorate, I think is not the right option. In this scenario, if you do an ABG, you will definitely find the lactates are pretty high and the urine output will be pretty low in this patient. So here you need to make sure that the patient should not arrest. And in case there is an arrhythmia and the patient arrest also, you can still maintain the circulation. So think of a, using an ECMO in this patient straight away. And as Sarah said, because the moment you put a, a ECMO, Clinically patient for some time will feel very good, but because ECMO is putting the blood back into the artery and this retrograde arterial pressure will improve the increase the afterload. So the patient will have the, the congestion will start going up because LV EDP will keep going up and up and up. So that is where the importance of LV unloading will come. So in a cardiogenic shock, when you use an ECMO, invariably it has been seen that more than 80% of time you will need an LV unloading device. And the simplest LV unloading device is a, a IABP, but that may not be enough. So most, so now the the people who can afford, they are going with the terminology called ECPELA, which sir has already told about it. So you use a ECMO plus an LV unloading. Now you look at another scenario. Let us go with this is so this is all about the patient who had got a no LVOT obstruction. Now look at the scenario where there is an LVOT obstruction. So because of the LVOT obstruction, the blood supply is not coming to the to the periphery and patient is going to hypoperfusion. So how do you overcome this LVOT? You cannot. Suppose it's a fixed aortic obstruction like a patient with aortic stenosis, you can put a balloon and expand it and then use an impella, no problem. But here it is not like that. It is a, it's a hyperdynamic situation because of high contractility, the LVOT is obstructed. Now if you try to push the impella in this, you are going to cause damage. Patient may go into heart block and things like that. 
So that's the reason why we are not using an impella in this set of patients. We go with an ICMO and then ICMO is definitely going to improve the perfusion in this set of patient. And slowly and steadily with ICMO, if you give them a little bit of beta blocker, you give them a little more fluid and all this thing, then slowly the outflow will start relaxing and patient will start improving. So that's the reason why in a LVO2 obstruction, you don't use an impella. IABP anyway is of no use in this situation. So this is the reason why we do not use impella or a, uh, or a IABP in a patient who has got a, a significant LV outflow tract obstruction leaving right because here you have a low cardiac output and this low cardiac output is a combination of fixed uh, that obstruction which has happened and the weak LV. So you can uh, if if somehow you can push and push the helium pella, it's a different thing. But I think that uh, rather than doing those maneuvers, the safest option is put the patient on ECMO and, and bring the patient back uh, immediately. Uh, I think it's a similar situation in the last year. Dr. Charan witnessed a situation which actually reported also a, a ovulation induction lady suddenly crashed in the OT and uh, came to our emergency room with uh, almost impending cardiac arrest uh, where they have to even resuscitate. And post resuscitation, the heart hardly was contracting. It was almost uh, ejection fraction of around 10, 15% where they had no perfusion at all. The pH was dropping to 6.9. As you said, it is cellular homeostasis has gone into a toss where they have to cannulate in the emergency room uh, via ECMO and in no time, within 24 hours, uh, they have started weaning the ECMO. In 48 hours, he's moved out of the ICU. So this is kind of a uh, situations where you are talking about all this. I think uh, what a wonderful discussion across. Uh, it's a uh, what a learning experience for all of us. Uh, I thank Dr. Rasekar sir, Dr. Puroit sir, in being a part of this um, uh, wonderful discussion, enlightening us all of us in uh, this area, which looks a little tricky in many contexts uh, and probably any um, kind of this academic sessions make us little more learned than over the time. And I thank Dr. Uh, Sri Charan in bringing those updates uh, to just brush through. Um, uh, I thank all of you. I thank all the participants who actually were uh, putting some questions across, which most of them were answered. And, and I conclude the session. Thank you all, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and Dr. Sri Charan. Wonderful presentation. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rasekar, sir. Thank you, Sri Charan. Thank you, Sri Charan, Venkat, Rasekar, sir, and all. Thank you, sir.